In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All throughout Holy Scripture, we are given this image of the vineyard. This is evidence through today's readings. We begin with Isaiah, who talks about the vineyard, all the way into the New Testament, where our Lord actually gives several parables where he uses this imagery of the vineyard of our Lord. And it's supposed to be evocative of this understanding, this imagery of fruitfulness, the fruitfulness of God and of his grace. And as the psalmist says, you know, a vineyard produces wine and wine gives warmth to the heart, right? It's supposed to be that place of peace and stability, specifically the dwelling place of Almighty God, right? That image of the vineyard is the dwelling place of Almighty God. The fathers teach that the vineyard, particularly when it's being used in the New Testament, it's, be, it's a reference, it's an image for the kingdom of God. That, that phrase, the kingdom of God, is used over and over again in, throughout the New Testament. As a matter of fact, throughout all of the New Testament, the, the phrase, the kingdom of God, is used over 80 times. And whenever you read through it, and whenever you come across that expression, the kingdom of God, especially whenever our Lord is talking about it, you see that he's using it in different contexts, right? And sometimes can be difficult to interpret what he means when he says the kingdom of God. Well, the fathers of the church give us three primary realities that the Lord is talking about whenever he is using that expression, the kingdom of God. The first is the reality of heaven, heaven itself. Ultimately, the kingdom of God is the dwelling place of God, right? So it makes sense that heaven would be the place where God is, is in his kingdom, the beatific vision, right? The second type reality that our Lord is expressing whenever he is saying the kingdom of God is the church. The understanding that our Lord is present in his church. And indeed, whenever we come into his church, we have an encounter with him. We enter into his kingdom. And then thirdly, lastly, the kingdom of God refers to our soul. The reality that our Lord actually dwells within us. He dwells within our soul when we are in the state of sanctifying grace. Now, whenever our Lord is using this imagery, when he's talking about the kingdom of God throughout the gospels, he's most often referring to those second and third images, right? The church and our soul. The reality of the church, his presence in the church, and his presence in our soul. And the Lord is drawing our attention to this, particularly in the parable that he's telling in today's gospel about the tenants that have charge over his vineyard, right? The first, the, the tenants, they, whenever the master sends out servants, the first of those, they, they beat, another they stone, and then when he sends his son, they kill him, right? The Lord here is he's making reference to the understanding, the idea that the Jews who have been given the care of the vineyard of the Lord, right? The place, the dwelling place of God, where God is made known, and they have not recognized our Lord, they have not recognized God in their very midst, whenever he has come to them and he has come to establish a greater relationship with them. He says, uh, the Lord has come and prostitutes and sinners have recognized him, but you who were supposed to have care over his vineyard, care over the, vi the kingdom of God, you have not taken care of it. You have not noticed him. So the Lord, he's, he's drawing for us this spiritual reality. He's drawing our attention to the, the spiritual principle of this contrast between complacency and vigilance, a contrast between the, reality, the spiritual reality of complacency and vigilance. I think that this battle between complacency and vigilance is sometimes overlooked and oftentimes not very well understood. Because when we hear the word complacency or we hear the word vigilance in a natural sense, we, we don't always tend to understand what our Lord is meaning when he says that in a spiritual sense. For example, when we talk about the reality of vigilance in the spiritual life, the reality of being vigilant for our Lord, 
we tend to think of that as a firmness, right? A fortitude, an alertness before uh, anything that could come. Now, that's part of it, but the reality is, is that the greater spiritual principle here, whenever we're talking about vigilance in the spiritual life, is about dependency. The reality of vigilance in the spiritual life is about dependency. It's about relying on God for everything. It's about turning to our Lord and recognizing him when he comes and then following him when he comes. You have that great image of the ten virgins, you know, waiting for the bridegroom to come. And it's through the, the vigilance of the five wise virgins that when they see the Lord, they submit, they follow him into the bridal chamber, right? It's whenever we are complacent in the spiritual reality of complacency that we are self-sufficient, that we are trying to find self-sufficiency here on earth. It's a lack of dependence on God. It's a, if you want to call it, an earthly independence where I'm seeking to find and take control of my own life. I don't want the Lord to come in and take control, right? I am quite satisfied with my desires, my passions and lusts, and I'm fine right here where I am. I'm not looking for the Lord to come and change any of that. There's a fear there. Isn't that interesting, that, that, it, that reality of the spiritual life, that whenever I am complacent, what's underlying that is a fear. I fear to be unhappy. And if I give those things over to God, if I am truly vigilant in spirit, and I am dependent on God for everything, he might take those things away from me. He might take away the things from me that I build up my stability and my peace. So often it is that I build up my stability and my peace in the things here in this life. I'm looking to the earth, the world, and all of its goods to sustain me. You know, oftentimes whenever I'm out on the missions, I get asked the question about the great chastisement. People will come to me and say, Father, when do you think the great chastisement is going to come? And what is it going to be like? Is it going to be another world war? Or is it going to be a, a, you know, a big meteor that comes you know, from space and wipes out half of humanity, right? Knocks us out of our complacency and forces us to recognize our dependence on God. What, what is the great chastisement going to be like, Father? And how should we prepare for it? I always find that to be an interesting question, very curious question, especially whenever we're talking about this spiritual reality of complacency versus dependence, right? Because I believe, and my answer to that question is always that I believe we're already in the great chastisement. I think we've been in the ch great chastisement for years now. Because what is more terrifying? What is a greater punishment for us as man than for God to do nothing, than for God to pull back his hand and leave us to ourselves. Because we're continually declaring to our Lord that we don't need him in society, right? The great cry of our culture today is individualism. I don't need God. I don't need his help. And it's almost as though our Lord is saying to us, okay, he's pulling back his hand and he's leaving us to ourselves and look at where we have come to. Look at what we have come to. The insanity of the culture that we are dealing with today. I don't think I have to convince anyone here of the insanity that we're dealing with in society. I mean, even five years ago, would we have thought that we would have been debating about whether or not boys can go into the girls' bathroom and girls can go into the boys' bathroom. We would actually be having a serious debate about this. A couple of years ago, I was uh, walking through the halls of the main building at the Shrine of Our Lady of Champion, 
the Shrine of Our Lady of Good Help. And I heard this commotion in the office of the gift shop there in the main, in the main building. And it sounded like there was a fight going on, right? Something, some people were arguing, debating about something. And so I kind of made my way over to the office and tried to figure out what was going on. And these two people were uh, very heated about something, right? I couldn't figure out what they, were, what they were talking about or what the exchange was about. But it was, it was clear that they were very passionate about something. So I asked, I said, okay, what, what's going on? What's the issue here? And uh, it turns out they weren't debating at all. They were very aggressively agreeing with each other because they both had children in the same public school. Now, I used to tell this story as sort of a shock value story, you know, but I know that you hear when I, when I tell this, it's not going to shock you, unfortunately, because it's so commonplace now. But they, they both had children in the same school, right? And there had just been a policy that had been released days before, and they were trying to determine what they were going to do. The policy that had been released that they had no say in was that all of the school bathrooms were going to contain litter boxes for all of the children that identified as cats so that they wouldn't feel excluded. And this was the environment that they were sending their children to school in. And they were, what they were so passionate about is, do we want our kids exposed to this type of insanity? We can look at that and we can say, what is going on? We can look at that and say, that this, how did we get to this point? But I think it's important for us, especially as Catholic Christians, those of us who try to follow that spiritual disposition of vigilance, of dependency on God, we have to recognize that this is society without God. This is what man looks like without the help of grace. And so, in all actuality, when I look at that, when we look out at the culture today, this should be not just a reason to be discouraged, it should be a conviction in here. It should be something that convicts us interiorly. Because we should recognize, I'm not above this. If I weren't attached to Almighty God, if I weren't at the very least striving for dependence on him, knowing his will, wanting to follow the plan and vocation that he has laid out for me, I would be right there, falling into the same traps, falling into the same insanity. And so our Lord, in the midst of all of this, well, we talk about how in this chastisement, the Lord is pulling back his hand and he's leaving us to ourselves, but that doesn't mean that he isn't involved. It doesn't mean he's not active in his church. As a matter of fact, I think we can recognize that the Lord is incredibly active, that he's pouring out his graces in abundance, and he's showing us with incredible signs that this is where the kingdom of God is where we will find a return to that peace, stability, and sanity. So what's the answer to all of this? Whenever I start looking out at society and the culture, what's the answer? What's the return journey back to the kingdom of God? There was a, a bishop who came to the great Father Hardin, Father John Hardin, and he said to Father Hardin, he said, Father Hardin, what should I do to increase vocations in my, in my diocese? How should, what would be the best way for me to increase vocations here in my diocese, right? And Father Hardin looked at him and he responded in his very dry Father Hardin voice, right? And he said, the best way to increase vocations in your diocese, Your Excellency, would be your canonization. And what was Father Hardin doing there? He was pointing out the reality that it's personal sanctity. It's becoming a saint that attracts the heart of man. 
It's no coincidence that whenever our Lord has raised up great saints throughout history, that there are those who are seeking a relationship with God, that they are attracted to that person, attracted to that saint. And this is what our Lord is calling each and every one of us to, to become a saint. The reality that God is asking of me to become the saint that he has called me to be. We oftentimes don't think about that. I don't think we think about it enough. We tend to think of the saints as people who are far away from us, people that are just outside of our reach. You know, Padre Pio, St. Catherine of Siena, St. Rita of Kasha, St. Teresa of Avila. You think of these great men and women that have lived throughout the centuries, and we say, ah, oh, well, they're awesome, but I couldn't be that, right? I couldn't do that. Why? Because that's exactly what our Lord is calling us to, that same type of vigilance that they responded to. Sometimes, whenever we're on the missions, we'll be asked to go and talk to a school, you know, if a school is associated with the parish. And so we'll go and we'll, we'll talk to the, the school children, and you can really only do this with, uh, you know, the, the younger grades, well, maybe like fourth or fifth grade type of school kids, right? So we'll ask the kids, we'll say, who here wants to go to heaven, right? And all the kids raise their hand. I want to go to heaven. Everybody wants to go to heaven, right? But then you ask them, well, who here wants to be a saint, right? And you only have like one overly pious kid in the back who he'll raise his hand, right? You know, I want to be a saint. But then you say to them, well, it's actually the same question, right? It's actually the same question. Becoming a saint is getting to heaven. And this is exactly what our Lord is calling each and every one of us in this very moment at this very time. What if we were to do it right now? What if we were to offer to God right now the gift of our vigilance, the gift of our dependence on him, the total gift of our heart? How much different would the world be? How much different would the great chastisement be if we became saints? If we transformed the world through the gift of our lives to God? We tend to get caught up in blaming other people, right? We look out into the world and we say, well, it's the liberals, right? If the liberals could just get it right and stop messing everything up, then everything would be right with the world. And then the liberals are saying the same thing about the conservatives, right? When in reality, we're all sinners, wounded, and recovering in the same hospital, the hospital of God's church. Some of us are trying to leave the hospital before we have been cured. We're trying to go out into the world, live out in the world, in a world that continues to wound and murder us. I'd like to close with one of my favorite stories from Saint Macarius, the wonder worker, a great father of the church. Saint Macarius talks about how he used to oftentimes communicate with the devil. He would have just conversations with the devil when he wasn't battling with the devil. Well, one time, Saint Macarius was walking down the road. He was headed to a monastery where he was going to visit the monks and the brothers at the monastery. And while he sat down, on the side of the road for a rest, he saw the devil walking along the road and was passing him. And he turns to the devil and he says, where are you going? And the devil looks at him and says, well, I'm headed up to that monastery to disturb the thoughts of all of the brothers there in the monastery. And he said, okay. And so Macarius, he just waits for him because I think he kind of wanted to know what was going to happen. So the devil goes up to the monastery and he does what he can. And then he comes back and when he passes by Macarius again, he says, well, how did it go? And the devil looks at Macarius and he says, terrible. None of those brothers would listen. None of them would take the thoughts that I was trying to give them. He said, except one, Brother Alexander, he ended up becoming my best friend. 
And he took everything that I gave him, and I was able to disturb him greatly. So the St. Macarius said, okay. And then he went on, and he made his way up to the monastery. And all of the brothers greeted the great Macarius. And he said to the abbot of the monastery, he said, I'd like to meet with Brother Alexander, if that would be okay. And so they said, sure. Brother Alexander would love that. So they bring Brother Alexander, and they, he has the opportunity to meet with Father Macarius privately. And he says, Father Macarius says to him, he says, Brother, how have you been recently? Brother Alexander doesn't want to reveal his heart because he's a little embarrassed, right? So he says, oh, I've been great, Father. Things have been wonderful here in the monastery. And Macarius says to him, he says, it's okay, brother. You know, we all suffer from temptation. You can open your heart. And when he says this, the Holy Spirit works in, this, in the heart of Brother Alexander, and he reveals to him all of the thoughts that he has been struggling with, the temptations that he's been giving into, and all of the sins that have resulted from it, right? St. Macarius says to him, okay, well, this is what I want you to do. He said, whenever you have those thoughts that come into your mind, I want you to immediately place yourself in the kingdom of God. Place yourself in the presence and dwelling place of Almighty God and read the scriptures. Go into the chapel and be before the tabernacle and read the holy scriptures. And if those, when those thoughts come up, you read the scriptures. And if they don't go away, you keep reading. And you keep reading until you are relieved of those thoughts. And Brother Alexander agrees to do this and he's, he's very refreshed by Macarius' words. And then Macarius eventually leaves that monastery. He's walking down the road. And the next day, while he's traveling, he sees the devil again on the road going back up into the monastery, right? And Macarius says to the devil, where are you going now? And he says, well, I'm going to go see all of the brothers there in the monastery, and I'm most looking forward to seeing my new friend, Alexander. And so he says, okay. So Macarius decides to wait for him again to see what happens. And when the devil comes back down the road, he said, well, how did it go? And he said, it went terrible again. And that brother Alexander was the worst of all of them. He didn't take anything that I was trying to give him. This is because when we place ourselves in the kingdom of God, when we are willing to be dependent on our Lord, we are given a power against the devil a power against the temptations of sin and our passions that we didn't know before. May we today give ourselves to our Lord in a way that maybe we haven't yet in our lives. I would encourage us to simply turn to our Lord and say, Lord, give me the grace to want to be the saint that you want me to be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.